Well, th th thanks a lot, Steve, and uh, I, I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. I, I, I gotta, I, I gotta confess to you, though, I don't know why I get invited to a aviation symposium of any type, because you see, in 1971, I flunked out of flight school. And this is a true story. I flunked out of flight school. Back then, it was uh, at the waning days of the Vietnam War. Uh, the Army really didn't need any pilots. We had an had a excess of pilots. And uh, I failed to solo in the required 12 hours or 14 hours or 15 hours or whatever. And, and I ended up being the night duty officer at Fort Walters, Texas for about six weeks, waiting for a board to convene to tell me I wasn't worth a crap as a pilot. And, and, I, and I knew the board was going to kick me out of flight school because my next door neighbor was the chairman of the board. And he said, you don't have a clue. You don't have a chance. Uh, but nonetheless, they apparently needed a night duty officer, and that was me. Now, to make a, a, a long story even longer, the, the fact of the matter is, at Fort Walters, Texas, the telephone doesn't ring at night. So I just sat there and did absolutely nothing, watched TV, and increased my vocabulary while I'd watch and read runs of Jeopardy. Uh, for about six weeks and then went on to Vietnam and I guess everything turned out okay. Uh, you got some slides for me, Becker? Let me, let me start. And, and I, during the course of this discussion, and I hope it is discussion, I, I'm going to make two points of order. The first point of order is I didn't invent this title, okay? And, and having said that, I, I think training innovation is important for us to consider. And training innovation is really upon us for reasons I'll talk about here in a few minutes. But better, faster is not better. Better is better. Cheaper is not better. Better is better. And if you can do it faster and better, that's good. And if you can do it cheaper and better, that is also good. But leave us not confuse innovation and innovations in training with fast and cheap, because it may not be. And if we get to the point of thinking in those terms, we may very well find out that on the backs of our soldiers and leaders, we have made the wrong decision, and frankly, we can't afford to do that. So my first point of order is, yes, training innovation by all means, and if we can do it faster and cheaper and still maintain the readiness that our force requires and this nation deserves, then we're okay. But leave us not confuse innovation cheap and fast, because it may not be. The other thing I would submit to you, and I stole this, uh, this quote on the bottom there from, from the aviation branch chief this morning, that the 11 Bravo in the back trusts that we have got our training and leader development right. So my first point of order then just to reiterate is better is better, cheaper may not be better, faster may not be better, and regardless, above all things that we're all about, as far as training is concerned, that the folks in the force trust us to get it right. All right, so that's my first point of order. I'll get to the other one later. Uh, question, is there a training revolution going on? Now I've seen it talked about in some of the trade papers. I heard Joe Morton, Martin at uh, CAC-T talk about it. Uh, a couple weeks ago when I was at a training conference at Fort Leavenworth. I've seen a few articles written about it, and frankly, I don't get it. I don't see it in that which the Army is doing today. I see us trying to get back the way we used to do stuff, but I don't see a revolution in training occurring. However, it is my fixed opinion, my opinion uh, that there is a perfect storm that has begin begun to brew relative to army training. And, and, and it's got several aspects to it, perhaps several uh, things that, that drive that perfect storm, if there is one at all. First of all, we got young people, leaders who have come back from 10 years of combat and they understand the environment in which they have been operating. 
And they understand that environment is not sterile. They understand the complexity of that environment is not just a force-on-force -force mixture, it's a force-on-force -force which has got blue and red and green and pink and purple and all kinds of other folks that interface in that environment. They understand that there are different precincts heard from in that environment. You have non-government organizations that are operating, you have government organizations that are operating, you have our interagency uh, sometimes partners, sometimes opponents, but folks that they're all trying to do the right thing but may not be pulling in the same direction. And that in and of itself creates an enormous amount of complexity and they, those young leaders and soldiers, have experienced it. And they come back to the good old United States or wherever they're stationed and they begin to understand that complexity needs to be injected in their routine training and it is not. So that's the, the second thing that I would, I would submit to you that our soldiers and leaders because of the environment they've been in for over 10 years are expecting and demanding some of that complexity to take place in their training because they understand that the, 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 the pool that they swim in has got a lot of other fish in it besides just those that wear the uniform. And it seems to me if there is a revolution going on and if there is to be any innovation in United States Army training, then the complexity of that training needs to be addressed in some way, shape, or form. Now, I'm not suggesting that we ought to go out and buy you know, or rent a thousand role players to go out and do a platoon exercise on the other side of the cattle guard at Fort Hood. But I am suggesting that there's some degree of complexity that's got to be appreciated by the individual soldier and leaders and organizations in order to operate and win in a complex world, which is in fact what our Army operation concept talks about. The third thing that I think is, has occurred that may have something to do with, with this revolution in training, if indeed there is one, is that commanders come back to their post camp and station and they understand the environment, they understand there's a requirement for complexity and they want to be in charge of making sure their unit is trained. In fact, they have an obligation to make sure their unit is trained. Yet, how have we trained formations, leaders, over the past six, eight, ten years? We've delivered training to them. I mean, you could go to the National Training Center five years ago and we were doing a mission rehearsal exercise and folks just showed up. And we had a team that taught them how to deal with IEDs, a team that taught them how to deal with the culture of the area that they were going to. You had a team of, uh, of experts that taught them all of these things, all of which was necessary in a mission rehearsal context, but it was the delivery of training. It was not the planning of training, the execution of training, all of the, the things that commanders traditionally do and are responsible for have not occurred in our army until just recently as things have slowed down a bit. And I would submit to you that we've got commanders and leaders who want to be in charge, yet we may not have prepared them to be in charge. Now I'm not suggesting we ought to go back to the quarterly training briefs that we used to do when I was a young leader. Uh, some of which were onerous, all of which were painful, and frankly, some of them were, were kind of a waste of time, unless the senior commander in charge really knew what he, what he was up to. But there is some kind of training management structure that needs to be taught and appreciated and inculcated into our leaders, lest we have a formation or formations that are sitting back waiting for somebody to come train them. Which I submit to you is not the way we want to train our formations because commanders are indeed responsible. The third or the fourth thing out there, which is everybody understands in spades, is there are budget pressures. And those budget pressures may very well require us to do things differently. 
And that is perhaps where most of the innovation needs to occur if there is any innovation to be had. Because less money means you got less money. And less money means you got to invest it wisely. Yet, all you got to do is look at the front page of any paper in the United States and you know that there cannot be any time out for readiness today. I mean, there never has been time for time out for readiness, but it cannot occur today. Because if anything, things have gotten more complex, more complicated, more convoluted, more gafushed, if you will. And yet we talk about a smaller army. Now you can you know, pick a number out of the hat. I've heard numbers as low as 420, numbers as high as 480. None of those numbers meet the requirement, I believe, that the nation has for our army. But nonetheless, we will have a smaller United States Army. It seems to me that if you have a smaller army, that implies more discriminant use of that capability. Somebody's got to be thinking about whether or not we want to send the army at the drop of a hat to something, or do we want to be more discriminant about where we send it? And regardless of all of that, regardless of all of that, if we are to be truly are to be a expeditionary army, it seems to me that we need to be prepared to arrive and fight and win on very short notice, which in turn implies perhaps the paradigm of mission rehearsal exercises in preparation for a 12-month deployment has gone the way of the dinosaur. Because if you're truly expeditionary, it means you've got to get someplace quick at the request of the National Command Authority, and you've got to be ready to operate upon arrival, which may not mean you have, or may mean you do not have time to go to the National Training Center or the JRTC or JMRC en route. And you may not have time at those training centers to develop a scenario and the texture and the context that you need to go to that place that you really haven't ever heard of before until you got the mission. All of which implies to me the primacy of home station training becomes that much more important. Home station training run by commanders, home station training focused on soldierly fundamentals, home station training that continues to build the best army in the world and solidifies that trust between the 11 Bravo in the back and the leader who leads them. So I ask you, is there a training revolution going on? My judgment is we've begun to think about it. And perhaps some of the, the parameters that I list up here are part of that thinking. But frankly, I haven't seen that thinking turn into thing, anything tangible yet. I haven't seen anything truly no fool and innovative relative to US Army training. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It doesn't mean there isn't a technological hurdle that we could leap over and and truly do something more innovative. But I just haven't seen it happen yet, at least from my lofty perch as an old retired fart. And I've seen people talking about, or heard folks talking about this thing called a training cloud, where you reach up in this cloud and pull down context for your training. And that may very well happen, but beats the hell out of me who's really working on it diligently to make it so. I've heard people talk about gaming as the engine of change. If you put a game in the hands of a young person and they get really involved in the game, perhaps there's some training benefit to be gained from that game. And while there are some folks at Fort Leavenworth who are thinking about it, I haven't seen anything truly tangible come out of that. I've heard a lot of folks have talked about simulations and how simulations can take the place of some of our live training. And I've, I've seen simulations that are really cool. You have too, I am sure. 
But yet we still have an attitude in our army that if it ain't raining, we ain't training. And I can tell you, you know, that I, I continue to hear people talk about, about the, how cool it is to combine live training and virtual training in a single exercise, this live virtual constructive thing. Well, I'll tell you a war story. 19, almost 25 years ago, I was the commander of the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment in Germany, and there's a fellow by the name of Jean, Dean Cash, who was the commander of one of the brigades in the 1st Armored Division, commanded by Bill Carter. George Harmeyer, if some of you may know, was the assistant division commander, and we went to Hohenfels. The 1st Armored Division went to Hohenfels. Dean Cash's brigade went to Hohenfels, and they conducted a live virtual constructive exercise. They had a battalion in the box at Hohenfels. They had a battalion in simulation at uh, Grafenvir. They had a battalion in some kind of simulators, I assume, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, at the ground equivalent of AVCAT or, or something like that. And we operated for, and, and I, as the commander of 11th ACR, having had some NTC experience, was asked to come be the, the senior uh, observer controller for the exercise, which I did. Happy to do it. And at the end of the exercise, you know, we did the, the standard AAR, and everybody did high fives on the objective and said, wasn't this a wonderful exercise? Isn't it really cool? And this is something we really ought to do more routinely and more often, and yet, Two decades have passed, and we haven't. And I can tell you my judgment is that live virtual constructive, we ought to get past the demonstration phase. We have demonstrated over and over and over and over that we can do it. What we haven't demonstrated was the will to do it and pull that, put that kind of capability, that kind of exercise, that kind of training on the mainstream of Army training as opposed to something we just want to demonstrate our ability to do it. And it's my judgment that uh, with a little bit of thought and a little bit of foresight and some vision, perhaps we ought to make those sorts of experiences part of the mainstream. So my answer, I don't know. I think we're on the cusp of perhaps a training revolution. By the way, the gaming industry, while we were at war these last 10 years, has done incredible things as far as gaming engines and, and uh, audiovisual techniques and all that sort of stuff, something we, we might ought to take advantage of. Wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be cool if two weeks after you came back to the NT, from the NTC, somebody gave you a disc, and on that disc was a game? And the game allowed you to play the exact missions that you just experienced at the NTC in different ways. Wouldn't that be cool? How excited would you get to be able to kick the ass of the Op 4 having them kick your ass on the actual desert floor? How cool would it be to relive those experiences and do different things differently to see how they worked? How cool would it be to be able to develop both yourself and the organization in that regard. I think it'd be cool. But then I'm just an old retired fart. I was at Fort Leavenworth uh, about, I guess about a month ago now, and uh, the Combined Arms Center was hosting a training forum for industry. And it had to do with how do we train to win in a complex environment. I mean, that was the question that they posed. And I stole these comments from now Brigadier General Promotable Joe Martin, who just took command of the combat to the net, or to, just took command of the NTC uh, last week. And his comment was this: Our current training is not adaptive. It doesn't support repetition. It doesn't develop cognitive dominance, whatever the hell that means. It's not low overhead. It's not available at the point of need. It's not agile and responsive and preactive as a process. He said, 
within the context of the new Army operational concept when in a complex environment our training needs to be more, uh, needs to improve in those areas that I show up here. We need to put the intellectual in front of the physical. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I do know that, that we ought to be doing some thinking before we go out and start doing. He suggested, or they suggested at, at the Combined Arms Center that training not only should be training for our formations and our leaders and our soldiers, it also ought to be a venue for innovation. A place where you can not, o not only learn according to U.S. Army doctrine and standards, but you have the flexibility to innovate within a certain range of parameters to do things differently, which in turn can be new doctrine, which is kind of sort of important. We always talk about delivering tough, realistic, multi-echelon training, and we ne generally relate that to a combat training center experience. But go back to the previous slide that I talked about. An expeditionary army may not have that luxury. I mean, to the, if the truth be known, we've never had that luxury. We've never had enough capacity at any of our combat training centers to train all of the formations that there are in the army. And so while we continue to train maneuver brigades, and think we're doing a wonderful job. There are support brigades, there are aviation brigades, there's battlefield sustainment brigades, there's artillery formations that don't get that opportunity. And maybe, just maybe, it is there where we ought to be reaching for and looking at and developing that innovation that we're looking for in training in those formations that don't routinely deploy to a combat training center and give them both the authority and the responsibility to develop some good ideas on how to train their formations that we can cascade into the rest of the Army. Progressive and iterative, iterative training. You know, I, I've had this notion for a long time. I, I guess you call me under, uh, it, it's, those, I, I'm, I'm an armor officer, okay, and I grew up with a thing called the UCOFT, Conduct a Fire Trainer. Many of you are familiar with it. And the UCOFT had, had this really unique way of training decisions inside an individual tank. If you think about it, the decision of what tar target to shoot in what order is really a decision-making exercise. And the UCOFT had a very intricate three-dimensional matrix that was set up on one axis was close and far, one axis was night and day, one axis was uh, moving and stationary, and obviously a close target is easier to hit than a far target, a moving target is harder to hit than a stationary target, it's easier to engage daylight than night unless you have good night optics, etc. And what the, the matrix did is took the crew through that matrix, and if you did really well on one exercise, it gave you a gave you another exercise that was more difficult. And the computer decided that. So over the course of multiple iterations inside the conduct of fire trainer, a TC gunner combination continued to get better because they were presented with even greater challenges every time they stepped into the, the simulator. What's the analog to that for a company commander? What's the analog to that for a aviation company? What's the analog to that for a maneuver battalion? And could you create such an analog? Where not only you go through a simulated exercise, but the simulation itself and the software and all the electrons and all that stuff understand how you did last time so that the next time you are presented with a similar problem, it is a more difficult to solve problem because you solved the last one reasonably well. And wouldn't it be cool if organizations were allowed to progress based on being given more difficult problems to solve because they solved the less difficult ones already? 
Those are the leaders that thrive in ambiguity is something that is embedded in our new operation concept and recognizing that warfare is indeed a human endeavor, which is all about what the Army is about and maybe, just maybe, we might forget it once upon a time. So anyway, that's what Joe had to say. And he encouraged industry to respond to those areas needing improvement in order to correct some of the things that he judged were not so spiffy with regard to our current training. Mike Lundy at the uh, Aviation Senior Leaders Conference a couple of months ago said the following about training. It quotes the AOC and then it talks about training, maximizing training opportunities. Now I would, I would submit to you that maximizing training opportunities just gets you there. It doesn't necessarily allow for innovation that is better, faster, cheaper. But it does get you there. And there is a certain wisdom about taking advantage of, full advantage of training opportunities that are afforded you. I would suggest to you that although I grew up in the combat training centers, I've spent six years at the National Training Center, I commanded it, I commanded the operations group, it seems to me that the NTC is not a place where you go train. The NTC is a place where you go to verify the validity and the efficacy of your home station training program. And oh, by the way, you receive a damn good set of training lessons in the process. But it seems to me that our combat training centers, as they have evolved, CTCs and MCTP, that they aren't places where you go and say, here I am, train me. They are places where competent organizations go to confirm that their home station training program was reasonably well put together, reasonably well resourced, and reasonably well accepted by the organization so they can get that much better through the experience of a combat training center. I go back to the issue of home station training. I think that home station training is the, the crown jewel in Army training these days. I do believe that innovation needs to start there. I do believe that that's the place where you can probably take best advantage of simulations and stimulations and gaming because of the limited capacity we have from one location to another. There's a, a study going on within Forces Command today. General Milley asks a really simple question. Are the units that are going to the National Training Center today any better off than the ones that used to go in the late 70s, early 80s, mid 90s? And <laughs> interestingly enough, the answer is, I don't know. And the answer is, I don't know, because every unit was different. Every unit had a different set of training resources. If you were at Fort Hood, you had West Fort Hood, you had all kinds of training and maneuver space, and perhaps, just perhaps, you had a commander who provided you the resources to do the training that you needed to do to get to the NTC. If you were at Fort Riley, Kansas, and Randy House was your commander, he was six inches up your ass the entire time you're doing your training in preparation to go into the combat training centers. In fact, he demanded that every unit have at least 60 days of field training before they ever went to the combat training centers, and he made sure that it happened. Then you had other units that didn't have the luxury of those kind of training resources or training emphasis or training areas and they would show up to combat training centers with perhaps less field time but not necessarily less preparation. So my judgment is home station training becomes a key and home station training needs to be somewhat standardized and in fact all those gazillions of dollars that we have invested in training aids and home station training simulations ought to be placed squarely on the roadmap of readiness for units with a requirement to actually use them. 
See, when I was at Fort Hood, we had this thing called CCTT. Some of you are familiar with it. It's a, a company set of simulators in this big ass building run by a bunch of contractors. And, in, and if you were a battalion commander or a company commander, you could go in there and use them. The thing I always found interesting about CCTT is you go in there and the, the folks that ran it would, would talk, sit down with the commander and say, okay, what you want to do? And it seems like, to me, we're better than that. What you want to do should be not being asked of our commanders. There ought to be a, a, a set of things that are kind of the minimum essential requirements, and then you can innovate from there. And yet we do have a lot invested in our training resources. I, you know, I, I sometimes wonder if anybody has ever taken a toll of all of the, the training resources that are sitting in warehouses someplace in the Army that have never been used in the last year, two years, three years. I bet it would be a staggering amount of money, time, effort that is put into maintaining all that stuff. But that's an aside. Anyway. That's what the aviation branch chief had to say about home station and CTC training in his recent leaders conference. And don't, don't get me wrong, I, I do think the, the notion of maximizing every resource that is devoted to training is absolutely essential. But I also believe that there may be some different ways of doing different things differently that get us to a higher level of readiness than we enjoy today. And I also believe that in an expeditionary army, that is an imperative. Pete Yostry, the folks down in Orlando are also in the training business, in case you were, uh, didn't know it. And they have a focus on some of the science and technology futures, uh, not unlike what Heidi Hsu talked about this morning at the opening of the conference. And these are their focus areas for science and technology relative to training, because they happen to be the folks that develop training devices for our Army. Synthetic environment. The ability to have a, 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 a virtual environment of some type that represents the complexity of the current uh, operational environment in ways that are meaningful to soldiers and leaders and organizations. A one world environment has to do with a database, the terrain that on which we operate that, that instead of having to go do uh, months and perhaps years of development of that terrain, it's already there for you. It's kind of like a, a Google Earth capability for training. Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence that allows avatars and other entities that might interface directly with a real live human in realistic ways with, with realistic uh, and understandable facial expressions and, and dialogue that, that allow leaders and soldiers to get more out of uh, the cultural context perhaps than they otherwise might, and without having to invest in a gazillion role players to do so. There's a place out in California called the Institute for Creative Technology that's doing some really interesting work in that regard. And it's got some interesting spin-offs to it. At Fort Benning, Georgia, not too long ago, uh, there was a thing, I forget the name of it, but it was a thing where individual soldiers who were developing leaders uh, in their BNOC class had a, an avatar with whom they could interface to do individual counseling, just like you would of an individual soldier. And the avatar had problems, just like an individual soldier might have. And he had facial expressions, just like an individual soldier. So you didn't have an individual soldier interfacing with that leader, but you had an avatar whose phenomenology was very, very similar to the individual soldier. Was it perfect? Hell no. Was it better than nothing? You betcha. And it's worth pursuing that kind of 
notion into the future in my judgment. Intelligent tutors. If you uh, are operating as a planner using CPOF, wouldn't it be nice to be able to call up what you did three weeks ago or four weeks ago and apply it in context of a different operation? Wouldn't it be nice to have somebody whispering in your ear saying, eh, you don't want to go left. That's not what your plan called for. That's where the bad guys are going to kick your ass. And there's a, an ability as we collect all of these mountains and mountains of data associated with not only how we train, but the, the, the way that we train in our predisposition for doing stuff for intelligent tutors to actually help us come to better decisions quicker. Big data and operations top process. I mean, there, there, is, uh, there is a wealth of opportunity out there in trying to figure out how to process and, and harness all of the data that is being collected. You know, it's not unlike that training cloud that I mentioned a few moments ago. Wouldn't it be nice if you're sitting at Camp Swampy someplace and you want to do an exercise, you can reach out and draw down from some place, some repository, and you really don't really care where the repository is, but you draw down context around which you can build a training exercise. Wouldn't that be nice? Particularly if you're going to, particularly if you're the commander of the 101st and you're planning to go to a combat training center and end up with a mission to go to Africa and deal with an Ebola crisis. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to contextually take yourself out of the CTC regimen and into the Ebola crisis regimen without having to do cheetah flips to do so? And my judgment is in the not too distant future that ability will be ours. And then the simple notion of being able to deliver training at the point of need. Wherever and whenever our soldiers are deployed, being able to provide to them the training that they need. How many of you, how many of us have experienced Iraq and Afghanistan and somebody drove by and, over, and just kind of souvenired us a whole bunch of really cool stuff? And most of that cool stuff ends up in a Connex container someplace for AMC to try to figure out how to retrograde it. Wouldn't it be nice if the, of that cool stuff, the stuff that was really cool and really useful, could training on those devices could be delivered to us in some way, shape, or form at the point of need. Not a, not a fielding type training, but a fielded type training. Wouldn't it be nice? And then there's the old issue of fundamental skills training. Now, I, I got to tell you, I'm an old dinosaur, and I think fundamental skills are kind of sort of fundamental. You know, and, and, you know, I think you ought to be able to, or, or you, ought, you need to be able to train to being able to hit the target when you pull the trigger. That's kind of fundamental. Being able to move about the battlefield with authority is kind of fundamental. Being able to react to contact is kind of fundamental. Being able to, to deal with, with obstacles that might occur in your way is kind of fundamental. Being, able, and, and being required and habitually react uh, our report accurately and quickly what's going on is kind of fundamental. And there's some individual things that are kind of fundamental, like physical training to prevent, to, uh, to provide you the stamina that you need to operate in these environments. Cultural awareness is, is becoming a fundamental, I believe. And then, of course, first aid, combat lifesaver, all that sort of stuff. All of those are, are in my judgment, fundamental skills. There are those, however, who suggest that move, shoot, and communicate is much more complex today than it ever has been. And I stole this again from the folks at Fort Leavenworth. The basics then and now, the basics have become more complex. Do you believe that or not? I don't know if I do or not, but it's kind of compelling. You know, the basics used to be pull the trigger, effectively engage the target. In the 21st century environment, the basics have become more 
not only hitting the target, but deciding whether to shoot or not. And is that a basic fundamental skill that we have to train our soldiers? The, the split-second decision-making associated with making life and death decisions relative to the use of your individual or your crew-served weapon. Movement used to be battle drill related. Movement today is much more complex if you're operating in an urban environment, for example. It may not be a standard drill. You know, a four-man stack may be standard, but you know, how you get there may not be. Communications used to be within you know, FM radio, direct line of sight, and it's become much more pervasive today, the use of digital networks and understanding what they do and what they can't do. Understanding that that friggin' icon on the map represents a platoon of soldiers. And understanding just because the icon is not moving doesn't mean nothing's happening. Basic physical training transitioning to total fitness. And importantly, the whole issue of discipline, which in my day and many of your days was doing the right thing when nobody's looking, today is doing the right thing when everybody's looking. Because we live in a world of you know, crazy media, social media, etc. My second point of order, in my judgment, decisive action is not a combat training center rotation. It is not a combat training center uh, scenario. It is how the United States Army fights decisively. And a decisive action just happens to be a label that we placed on the rotational scenario. It also seems to me that being able to fight decisively is enabled by a, some, a commitment to some kind of training management system that puts commanders in charge, puts senior leaders responsible for giving those commanders the resources and shaking hands and saying, by God, you got it. You can count on getting those resources because you and I just made a contract. And finally, focus on an unwavering commitment to whatever the fundamentals of soldiering are in the 21st century, but those fundamentals are indeed fundamental to our business. A few random thoughts at the end, and I'll throw it open to whatever questions you all want to throw around to each other or to me. Uh, first of all, it is extraordinarily important in my judgment that you must be able to both operate and learn simultaneously. An after-action review is not something that is just done at a combat training center. It is done whenever you have action and you review what happened and what didn't happen and you learn from the experience. And importantly, you share what you learned and the experience with other formations to make sure that they can grow based on your experience. Secondly, if we are to be an expeditionary army, which we say we are, if we are to operate as we say we will under the army operating concept, training is more important than it has ever been, in my judgment. And it will, there will be a, a tendency in our military, because this is the way we always do it, to draw down our training resources commensurate with the size of the force. And I would suggest to you we ought to be doing just the opposite. Because a smaller force, an expeditionary force, damn well better be able to deploy and fight and win upon arrival regardless of having to stand in line waiting for resources to show up. I believe that decisive action requires Adaptation, but adaptation is founded on fundamentals. You know, I grew up as a cavalryman. Return, fire, deploy, report, develop the situation was kind of second nature. At least it was supposed to be second nature to us as we grew up. But you know, it took a long time for me to recognize that return, fire, deploy, and report instinctively 
gave the leader time to think about what was happening. And that is the essence of developing the situation. Organizations that routinely and habitually can return fire and deploy and report what's going on give leaders the luxury to think about what's going on because their unit has instinctively dealt with the urgency of whatever problem that they are faced with. In the, in the absence of that habitual response, that return fire deploy report, and I'm not sure what the 21st century equivalent is, but there's got to be something. In the absence of that, you're trying to grab your ass with both hands and deal with decision making at the same time. And it becomes much, much more difficult in my experience. Our doctrine does indeed depend on culturally astute leaders, whether you like it or not. And finally, in my judgment, regardless of who you are and where you sit, you need to take time to think both routinely and often. So with that, I open it up to any comments, discussions, or questions that might, yes, sir. Yeah, would you go to the microphone there? Because that's what it's there for. It's probably got an on-off switch or something on it, too. I'll speak up. Have a, oh, hey. there we go. Cool. Sir, my name is Jason Blevins. I'm the senior aviation trainer at JRTC and, and can pretty much echo everything you just said there about units arriving at the CTC to get trained as opposed to having some sort of logical gated training strategy uh, so that they're validating the readiness when they show up. Um, specific to aviation, <clears throat> one of the issues that we see a lot of is leaders that are focused on tasks. So battalion commanders, S3s, XOs, trying to tell their units, this is how you're going to fly this mission. This is how you're going to set up your FARP. This is how you're going to do this. As opposed to analyzing adjacent unit missions and higher headquarters missions and then assessing how they can uh, describe the effects they want to achieve with their aviation task force and allow the companies to plan in detail how they're going to execute to achieve those effects. And then we close the loop, of course, through the back brief process. Just haven't seen a unit, but maybe one that's really good at that. Um, one other thing is at the end of the senior leader forum that you had those thoughts up from General Lundy on, there was a specific discussion uh, that we had one day with where we were talking about how to prepare an aviation task force to go to a combat training center. The, the discussion somewhat went to how does a cab train their staff to uh, basically conduct combat operations because they only get the one every two year warfighter exercise thing. So one of the thoughts that we had that we're working now is is some sort of distributive type exercise echoing your virtual and constructive piece where the cab headquarters chooses a CTC throughout the year in which they set up their command post, provide the mission command oversight, they have one aviation task force at the CTC executing live you have another one back at home station executing virtual, possibly in the AVCATs and pieces like that. And they're giving mission orders and, and working through that, that process. You know, a lot to be ironed out with the command relationships and things like that, but a way to really get the cab who doesn't get to go to a CTC engaged in some of that training. So that's some of the things we're looking at. Uh, I personally owe the development of that and do a paper that comes out and and uh, through the Aviation Center, but that's, that's where we're looking at from the JRTC side. Well, th thanks a lot for your comments. I, I, you know, I, I think there's a pony in that stable someplace. Uh, but the, my, my angst about it is it's, you know, we, we have demonstrated for decades our ability to do exactly what you're talking about. Why haven't we told people that's the way we're going to train? Why haven't we made it part of our our training guidance, our training philosophy, our, our, our training something. Uh, it, it just seems to me that that's the next logical step. Thanks. I don't think I'm smart enough to ask the question, so I'll, I'll make a comment. But the issue of training and readiness, the innovation may be in figuring out readiness to do what? You know, the 30 or 40 years that we thundered around, we thought we understood what we were going to be asked to do. And it was still very hard. 
it seems like to me, Scott, the big challenge today is it, uh, it's, it's not really knowing what you're going to be asked to do, so how do you prepare a, units and leaders that generically can do what they're asked, what they will be asked to do, and getting ready to do everything is the same as getting ready to do nothing. So I, I don't know where is the innovation, I guess. Well, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a bit per, perplexed like you are. I, I do know that, that the Army operating concept was purposefully uh, purposefully structured, if you will, uh, not unlike the old uh, air land battle concept. And I mean, and, and, and by that I mean, the, you know, the folks at TRADOC, the folks at CAC, looked at that document and said, you know, that was pretty cool. Fight outnumbered and win was a pretty definitive statement. And from that concept flowed the requirements for hardware and formations and training in order to accomplish that. And they took that document kind of as a foundation and said, how do we make that same kind of connection with a 21st century environment? And that is what they came up with when in a complex environment. Uh, and I'm, you know, I don't mean to speak for Dave Perkins, but but there, he's got a, a really interesting briefing that talks about, you know, Airland Battle had the big five. This concept has big five also, but that five is a different five. It includes things like uh, human develop, optimizing human performance, uh, understanding the culture within which you're operating. It's much more. Uh, much more human dimension focused than hardware focused because there's this this uh, this attitude I guess that suggests that the place where we can gain the most benefit is through development of human capital I mean we all know it we've all seen it our soldiers are so incredibly talented all we got to do is figure out how to optimize their capability and and let them go forth and do good things. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, CB4 Rob Teague. I'm also with the uh, operations group. I asked that this uh, slide be brought back up because I had a couple of thoughts about it. And again, it's just um, not really questions or necessarily opinions, but just some thoughts. Um, I think the biggest one uh, that I wanted to uh, talk about was uh, that there is no time for, uh, timeout for readiness. Uh, and it's kind of interconnected with a smaller army implies a you know, more, more discriminant use. Uh, I think that uh, history has taught us, especially in the 90s, where we've kind of drawn down our army, yet the operational tempo didn't necessarily slow down in terms of places like Somalia and Bosnia. So I think that that's, that's the reality that we kind of need to look at. Uh, also in terms of uh, uh, complexity in, in training and in the budgetary limitations that we have, maybe we should start looking to the other services. And I think that we're doing that to a small extent with maritime operations. But uh, one of the things that I think units are learning is that the Navy does things a certain way. And it's important that we learn that as part of the training that we're doing. Because if we can't land on a boat, then, then what good is maritime training? So in terms of complexity, uh, and just working with other services can sometimes be complex. Uh, I think that over the last decade plus of wars in Afghanistan and Iraq where we've worked with other services and other nations, uh, it's not always something that goes smoothly. So incorporating that into the training uh, could possibly help. And also with the budgetary issues, asking other services to help pay for training. I know that may not go over very well, but it's, it's an option. So um, again, sir, just some thoughts. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Any other comments, questions, answers? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Janine Jacob, Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, this is a slightly unrelated question, but uh, in terms of this training revolution, how are we factoring in resilience training and training for psychological health? 
You're asking me? I'm, I'm the most psychologically imbalanced person in here. Or, or just something. I'm an innovation strategist, so yeah. just no, something I, I, to yeah, for as, us to be As I, I, I kind of suggested up there, I think that's, that, that is a, a, one of the emergent fundamentals, if you will, of uh, individual basic skill requirements. Uh, now, how are we doing that? I, I am not conversant in Army resilience training, although I know it's going on. Yes, sir. I, I do know, however, that, that there are some very, very sound uh, practices that the Army is not taking advantage of. Some coming out of the medical community, some elsewhere, but, you know, such stuff that we ought to take advantage of. Yes, sir? To add to that point, uh, at the CAC forum, the industry forum uh, a few yeah. months back, there's a lot of work that's being done on the West Coast in terms of new research on being able to baseline and think of it as PT for the brain uh, and not just using it as they, okay, fine, we'll show up and we'll do our 30 minutes and then we'll get out of here and then we'll check the block. But the idea is to be able to use that as a baseline over time so then you can be able to detect at an individual soldier level where is the anomaly, where did something happen, wait, the soldier's mental acuity was at this and then after a traumatic event, then suddenly it changes and allows you to re redirect on that individual, as well as help them develop the mental stamina and things of that at a, at a more academic level to be able to help them do that. So there's a lot of discussion on that I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, my name is Rob Cordray. I'm with GDIT. Uh, I guess since we're just talking about concepts here today, you know, I think the revolution comes back to your point, sir, which is... What are we training for? And I think the, the way that the Army has approached training is it's been mission focused. It's been looking at a specific you know, um, environment and a, a well-known situation, a no, well-known environment, things like that. And our entire process is based upon that. The whole MDMP process is based upon uh, a, a specific type of operation. Well, the revolution may in fact be that the process itself is wrong. The way we approach those missions and the way that we analyze them is wrong. Uh, we talk, you know, we may not do a very good job anymore with intent uh, and then be able to say, what does intent look like at brigade level and how's it different from what intent should look like at battalion, at company, battery, platoon, uh, and then be able to train and, and put that. So I think for so long, at least for the last decade, it's been about preparing for a specific mission, being spoon-fed that approach, and our leaders have been responsible for leading people through that, that model, the resultant of the model, as opposed to training those leaders to how to be the ones that are actually serving, that they can, that they can think strategically about what are the potentials, and whether or not you're approaching a, uh, a mission like an Ebola response, or you're addressing uh, next phase in uh, Iraq, Syria, it's the, it's the process that's important uh, and how those leaders are approaching the process, the way they, they deconstruct the mission. And I've just not seen a whole lot of emphasis on that kind of approach. It's been the, well, have you followed this model? And this model will lead you to Mecca. Uh, that's not necessarily going to be what gets them there. Just my thought. You, you familiar with, with the operational design? What do you think about that? <sighs> I think it puts, I think it, that's what sets the mark on the wall for that. So the new operating concept talks about needing leaders for resilience, that, those that can look at it. What you're talking about is we have to take the Army to college. You know, they talk about college is important because it's te not teaching what to learn but how to think. We're talking about taking the Army that's been in high school for a long time and taking it to college. And that's going to be very, very painful, but it's going to force us to relook. how do we look at that? How do we get... T t tactical level and give them the mission and give them the, the leeway to do their, and how do we give them the tools for how to, to look at that environment? Um, 
and how do you keep higher headquarters out of their business and so they can continue to focus on their level of war as well. Okay, thanks. Sir, I hate to pull you up on